thank you, uh, Mirel, for that introduction, um, for inviting me here. Uh, I don't have anything meaningful that I've uh, written on, on uh, Fat Star. So uh, what I tried instead of to pretend, other than reading a lot to try to catch up, uh, is share with you some uh, uh, work that I've done and that I'm doing as part of an emerging set of network of networks of legal scholars, social scientists, um, um, economists, political scientists, sociologists, organizational um, um, uh, management science people, uh, people in SDS, working broadly speaking within an umbrella of, you do want to run, start running this so that I, I don't go over my 40 minutes um, and we have time for questions and answers. That would be helpful to me. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> working to try to understand how we reintegrate an understanding of the economy and power in the economy into a post-neoliberal understanding of uh, the way society works. Um, and in particular, I'm going to focus on the role of technology, and eventually I will get to how this connects to uh, uh, Fat Star. Uh, so for the last 20, 25 years, some version of this kind of a, an image uh, has been quite popular in expressing the position that something very distinctive happened with modernity, with the emergence of capitalism, where the um, 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 <clears throat> human population exploded at a turning point with the second industrial, with the uh, second agricultural revolution or the industrial revolution, and what typifies is a rapid increase in human well-being through sustained increase in productivity through the in continuous application of technological change to production. Uh, our own version um, uh, has been Moore's Law and all of its connected claims ranging from robotics to AI to managing uh, uh, cities um, uh, and you name it, the stuff that you're all working on today. The reality has thrown a few monkey wrenches. Uh, one of them is the fact that when you actually look at productivity growth, since 1973, for the last 45 years, it's actually been mostly slower, substantially, than it was not only in the preceding 30 years, the so-called golden age of capitalism or the glorious 30, uh, but in the preceding century, uh, with a little bit of noise uh, around the millennium with initially IT producing and then IT using firms. So productivity growth is substantially lower over the last 45 years than in the preceding 100 years. Business dynamism since the 80s, as measured by share of activity of new firms and share of employment by new firms, is down rather than up. Market concentration, <clears throat> market concentration uh, is up since the mid-90s. These are American data. Um, markups, that is to say, the share of prices that comes from the exercise of market power, that is rent extraction, rather than uh, improved productivity has been increasing since uh, 1980. So we have lower business, lowest business lower business dynamism, lower um, 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 productivity growth, higher market concentration measured both by number of firms and by the share of revenue that accounts for rent extraction. All the while, as we are seeing more and more evidence consistently that inequality has increased, and in particular in the United States, that you see a massive extraction of value of the top 1%, representing heavily uh, the financial industry and executive compensation, a flattening of uh, um, uh, median compensation and median uh, uh, income, and an increase in disease and deaths from diseases of despair, from people who suffer from economic uh, precarity, uh, suicide, opioid overdoses, and uh, cirrhosis, creating um, um, non-high school, uh, high school and lower educated adults in the US being the only population um, uh, in the uh, uh, wealthier countries that has seen a decline in life expectancy since the early 1990s. Unsurprisingly, the result has been a dramatic decline 
in belief in democracy and an increase in the success of ethno-nationalist um, uh, uh, politics and the politics of resentment. And while it is undoubtedly true <clears throat> that race, racism, ethno-nationalism, and misogy misogyny have long been used to divert uh, working class populations away from class politics, there's increasing evidence both from the US and Western Europe that um, uh, the increasing economic insecurity is strongly associated with support for these kinds of um, um, uh, politics. Uh, so the question that I want to talk about then is what role, if any, has technology played in rising inequality? What is the relationship between economic inequality and racial or gender discrimination that are so central to the subjects uh, that you've been discussing? And therefore, how does answering these questions apply to fairness in algorithms? Um, <clears throat> up until the last three or four years, beginning in the 1990s, the dominant theory in labor economics for how technology interacted with inequality was called skills bias technical change. The idea is that labor markets clear the value of labor efficiently based on how the skills and attributes with which individuals come to the labor market are complemented by the capital that firms produce and therefore people are compensated their marginal contribution relative to the capital available. With the increase in automation, where routine jobs are easier to automate and non-routine jobs are harder to automate, people with relatively middling education became less valuable. People with higher education became more valuable, except that at the very bottom of the distribution, people with things that were hard to automate, like vision, like a janitor in a, compli in, in a uh, complicated uh, warehouse environment, um, uh, would also be more valuable. Now, this was the basic model. Um, the last three or four years have made it fairly clear that it doesn't quite fit differences in patterns of distribution uh, change across different countries at the same technological frontier. It doesn't quite fit. The model had to be changed every decade or so because the initial model fit the 80s in the US, but not the 90s. The secondary model, the 90s, but not the 2000s, et cetera. So I'd say in the last three or four years, uh, the evidence no longer supports it. But it's an important framework because it continues to be the core underlying uh, framework that explains <clears throat> the claims that robots will take all the work or that platforms will casualize all work. The critical point is technology is exogenous and deterministic. It marches to the beat of its own drum. Markets are more or less efficient and deterministic in the sense that they will equilibrate on, on, on prices. All society has to do is adapt or decline. Um, the three major assumptions underlying the efficient markets uh, uh, story have essentially been abandoned by uh, uh, advanced social sciences. Agents don't fit in across the social sciences and the behavioral sciences. We've seen repeated experimental data that agents no longer fit homo economicus or rational self-interest and motivation. Um, um, instead, we're socialized, we're situational and coherence seeking, and we're reasonable rather than rational. There is no perfect information. Imperfect information is everywhere and asymmetrically distributed, which means that institutions can't be thin, just property and contract and the, everything else equilibrates. They have to be thick. They're rules of the game. They shape what we want, what we desire, what we know we can withhold, what we know we can't withhold. They create bargaining power in many dimensions, and power is essentially a standard element of uh, market society. So the broad literature <clears throat> that has used over the years and initially was heterodox and now I'd say is more mainstream labor economics explanation for rising inequality is institutions. Labor law, monetary policy, trade and globalization, executive pay, financial deregulation, antitrust have all driven dramatic changes in relative bargaining power of labor over management, of managers over shareholders, and contributed to this story. The main absence here is technology. It actually has the opposite story with no technology. 
Um, there's a little bit of institutional economics in the new institutional economics that does include some reference to technology, but it's very thin. It's essentially the, the neoclassical adaptation of institutional politics and really focuses on IP and antitrust. And again, largely suggests that institutions shape the rate of innovation, but not really its direction and continues to be primarily focused on uh, um, market, um, uh, on efficient markets. At the other end, there's uh, several decades of work in science and technology studies that rejects this separation completely and, 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 and demands that we think of social, of social technical systems as a single integrated framework where technological systems are part and take social meaning from uh, their impact within institutional, social, and cultural settings Social, economic, and, and political power are sometimes settled through technological design, with the classic example being um, uh, 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 Robert Moses' low bridges over Long Island uh, uh, parkways intended to prevent buses from arriving at certain um, um, uh, beaches and therefore achieving racial segregation through technology after it's not available uh, in law. And there are lots of other examples. Um, <clears throat> What I want to try to do here is embrace both of these. Try to help us not ignore the correct insistence of STS of thinking of social technical systems, but trying to separate out a little bit so that we can pick each one up and examine it before we put them all together um, of how we think of the material context, nature and technology, and the social context, institutions and ideology, um, um, together as a system that defines power in social relations. And the critical point is, think of power as the ability of any party or parties to get their way in some kind of interaction with another. And that way may be profit, that way may be values, it may be any one of several things. That power is dependent on the social and material context, which itself is subject to conflict. Let me unpack a little bit what I mean by this. Um, but before that, <clears throat> let me also suggest that this model, while I will focus on the economy and economic inequality, also is useful for thinking not only about social relations of production, but also about social relations of coercion backed by legitimate violence, or what we think of as the polity, social relations of reproduction or kinship, and social relations of meaning making. And again, what I'm trying to do here again, not deny the interconnectedness of everything that is so often uh, uh, we find in contemporary social theory, but the utility of separating out each so that we can examine it separately. Um, <clears throat> At the broad macro level, we can think of a shift from a period of sometimes called high modernism, 46 to 73, as combining a set of ideas about expertise, standardization, authority with a set of institutions like managerialism or Taylorism or Fordism, uh, national and regulated industries heavily embedded in the state, uh, together with a set of technologies like the assembly line electrification, et cetera, that together enmeshed what was the glorious 30 or the golden age of capitalism. After the great inflation of the 1970s, we see an interregnum in the 70s and beginning in the 80s, the development of what will eventually come to call neoliberalism, uh, which includes, first of all, both a right and a left spin rise of individualism, choice in free markets, rational actor alongside self-actualization and individual rights, a set of institutions from deregulation and privatization and globalization <clears throat> through to civil rights and recognition of, of difference and, and individuality, through a set of technologies that again, while I focus on the economy, it's no less meaningful to think of the ways in which birth control and home appliances changed the dynamics of power over household production in the kinship system as it is to think about how the optical scanner and, uh, and the container affected globalization and labor relations. The point is not to 
make one superior or more important than the other, but to understand them all as both connected to each other, because obviously changes in household production then also change the composition of the labor force as we move to service and a more feminized uh, work uh, space that nonetheless leverages inequality and discrimination in order to suppress wages in the service sectors, not trying to separate, just by trying to clarify what the bits are. Macro, meso. The most immediate precedent to the set of concerns you're thinking about now is, uh, are the politics of technology in the 1990s and 2000s around the emergence of the internet. And I'm gonna use those to give you a little bit of a feel in your fingers for what the meso-level interactions are between firms and collective action methods and individuals, and think of it largely as a, an arena of conflict over power to produce software, to produce culture, to produce knowledge, in which individuals alone and in networks, in informal networks and in organizations of civil society come in conflict with firms alone and in networks, be it the Recording Industry Association, be it the MPAA, be it the, the uh, uh, Telecommunications Industry uh, Associations, fighting over each and every one of these dimensions of power in order to achieve greater power over time. So what do I mean by technolo individual technological uh, 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 interventions? Phil Zimmerman produces PGP and tries through that technology to intervene in the question of privacy and encryption. The free and open source software community intervenes by imagining that it can build freedom into the infrastructure if it is all not proprietary and shared among us all. On the other hand, you see industry trying to intervene by producing digital rights management, by uh, introducing later on the App Store to control, um, 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 to control more of the infrastructure, the debates over, the, uh, over broadband and broadband access. In each case, the industry, individual firms, but also collectively, tries to shape the technology tries to shape the politics and the institutions and the legal framework, increasing uh, intellectual property, decreasing privacy as opposed to the other way around. Uh, uh, Julie Cohen's new book, uh, Between Truth and Power, is a beautiful study of how that institutional set of choices uh, uh, created the conditions for the present state of, of, of uh, surveillance. Uh, and ideology, is piracy a good thing or a bad thing? Um, are we talking about free culture or are we talking about uh, piracy? So we had this intentional intervention in technology, in institutions and ideology intended to shape either a more centralized or a more decentralized model of, of production over the core knowledge economy. What does that mean when we come down to the micro level of the individual firm's decision? And this is really critical in my mind. Once you understand that power is a normal part of market behavior, it's just a fact of the world. Once you understand that power is, act, is created and acted upon through institutions, technology, and ideology, a firm will seek to, in, to improve its position by trading off two competing strategies. A strategy that is productivity enhancing in order to be better than its competitors, the standard model, and a strategy that is rent seeking and power seeking in order to increase its strength, extract as large a portion of the rents as is available at the moment, and spend down some of it in order in the next round to have even stronger position because of better institutions, better from its perspective, et cetera. So what we get is this dual strategy and constant trade-off between seeking advantage through improvement and seeking advantage uh, through power in relations with workers, with consumers, with competitors, and with suppliers. And while this is very abstract, I'll make it more concrete, don't worry. Critically, we can think of two dimensions of power or two dimensions of constraint on power, a horizontal and a vertical. So 
developing technologies like the App Store, like non-standard plugs, institutions like strong intellectual property as opposed to open standards, that increase entry barriers to competitors or innovators who could compete for the market, increases horizontal market power for the firm acting. Um, manipulating demand, and this is critical now for surveillance capital, manipulating consumer demand has both a horizontal dimension because it creates unrealistic differentiation between products and creates unrealistic stick stickiness to a product, but also vertical power in terms of being able to extract more of the joint surplus between the producer and the consumer. And then dimensions of vertical power, increasing competition among the workers while decreasing it among the employers increases the bargaining power of the employers, similarly with relationship to suppliers. Increasing monitoring over employees, we'll talk about in, in a bit more, disruptive collecting action. All of these things decrease the relative bargaining power of labor or suppliers, increase the share of the pie that the acting firm uh, uh, can pursue. <clears throat> All of these together, all of these together offer a better explanation for the coincidence of facts with which I started. If it is the case that firms as a whole seek both productivity enhancing and power enhancing strategies, then a moment during which on one hand the state receded under the ideology of deregulation and privatization and worker power decreased under a set of institutional and political moves that uh, uh, made unionization harder and decreased the range of things you do can work about, it is rational for firms to pursue more rent extraction than productivity improvement technologies. It is rational and it's expected that what we'll see is the, exactly what we saw. Declining productivity, declining business dynamism, harder for new entrants to come in, and uh, increasing inequality and extraction uh, from broad working class. Okay, at long last, what's this got to do with you? Um, or at least, what do I, in my limited knowledge of your field, think it has to do with you? Let's see how it works out and open it as a conversation rather than as an assertion. So if you think, for example, of yesterday's uh, uh, session where, where um, Elettra Bietti talked about, about greenwashing versus ethics washing versus ethics bashing. And uh, one of the questions raised this challenge around the intercept piece about what is or isn't. Uh, is AI ethic just corporate strategy? Is it really a genuine? I think that's the, that, I read this as, hey, I know this movie. This is number two. But we have both. We have genuinely well-intentioned, committed individuals acting out of values within organizations and out of organizations trying hard to develop technologies, build better algorithms, define better systems that will lead to a more fair outcome. We also have firms that know perfectly well. They've also been in this movie before. They know perfectly well that being able to shape that research, being able to decide that Amazon co-sponsors with the NSF a call for fairness in algorithms, uh, or that Facebook will, will uh, fund a massive uh, uh, program at a university to do it. Being able to be there in the construction of our knowledge base and our ideology is a central part of strategy. Being able to funnel the algorithmic fairness into dimensions that are less threatening to rent extraction rather than those that are more is valuable. So it's a contested field rather than that there's a true or false statement. And of course, when you see opportunities like this, community groups, workers, et cetera, and not corporate AI ethics and judgments are primarily responsible for pressuring, that's an assertion of primacy of who matters, but it is a move within the same uh, debate. Um, again, I focus on the economy I see this as largely the same in the dimension of polity and elsewhere when we're talking about algorithms with regard to surveillance. I focused here on firms, but it's not as though government agencies can't have the same micro-foundational analysis and they're trying to pursue their own goals. They're not somehow abstract, benevolent uh, uh, regulators like uh, neoclassical economics want. Uh, nor are they uh, uh, perfect authoritarian systems. They're complex human organizations with their own desires, and they also know that they're playing in this model, and that's connected there too. And we see again, uh, uh, of course, that. 
what I'm trying to do now is map what I see in your work to what I think is just beginning here and there what I saw. And maybe it's just that I don't know, and you'll point me to the 700 papers that are doing it, in which case I'll say, well, great. Um, if you think of the classic liberal model of inequality, individuals have different attributes, efficient labor markets assign jobs, you get individual economic outcomes. The redistribution is either very minimal to, to prevent um, um, a bad luck, a form of insurance, a little bit of adjustments for moral hazard, or, or some real investment in, in the attributes, like, like uh, corrective educational inf uh, uh, measures, et cetera. Um, technical systems here are relatively thin. They just might misdiagnose who is really good and misprice. And you have some of that work, but not huge. Much more important, I think, and much more central to the work that I've been able to read before, and certainly everything I've heard here in the last day and a half, falls in what we could think of as this Weberian and rights model of inequality, where individuals occupy different status positions, not in the economy, in society, and their, and their, and their social relations status from past social hierarchy struggles. Markets price occupations, but access to the occupations is based on access to the status hierarchies. So essentially what you have here is opportunity hoarding, and the conflicts are over equal opportunity to occupy privileged market positions. I assume that once I've described this, you'll recognize a lot of the work. So if you're talking about concepts of individual and group fairness, if you're talking about um, 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 uh, translation essentially of historical position into new social position, that's admissions to education. Uh, if you're talking about transposition of social hierarchy, uh, into a positions in the economy, like in hiring, as we just saw in the prior um, 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 uh, panel or, or credit, uh, as well as into uh, positions in the polity or reproduction, be they criminal justice, be they healthcare. Here, you see an incredibly rich amount of work on this problem of opportunity hoarding, on this problem of uh, misrecognition of who is and isn't um, uh, the right person to get the right things based on potential past behavior. And we are seeing a, a, a reassertion of things that in law we found when we talked about affirmative action. And so the debates, the, even including one that we just had a couple of panels ago, about whether or not specifically recognizing uh, groupings was a way to improve or not, that's a replication of affirmative action. Uh, now, in, in, in a couple of papers by Cynthia Dwork this past year, composition beginning to replicate intersectionality debates and trying to build them into, uh, uh, into algorithms. But a lot of the more broad work on uh, algorithms has also focused specifically on economic inequality, which I see less of, uh, at least I haven't come so much across, in the uh, computer science work on, on inequality. And let's think about that for a moment. If you take this, this new work on, um, on the effect of algorithms on shifts and on shift work, clearly what you see is that workers of color have it worse, women of color have it worse, Latino work, uh, workers, Latinx workers have it worse, uh, but you're talking about differences of between 5 and 20%, depending on what you're looking for, in terms of bad outcomes because of highly exploitative workflow management algorithms. For the overall, so there's a discrete discrimination component, but there's a massive component that is connected to hunger, that is connected to loss of housing, with shifts being lost and, and insecurity in terms of income flows uh, that is entirely independent of the question of discrimination. And so, and, and again, we're seeing, I'm, I, I at least could see in the AI Now report from December, an, a, a claim of increasing recognition of this problem within your community. I'm not coming from, from nowhere. I don't think you don't think about it at all. Um, but I think it's a really hard problem. And let me talk a little bit about why I think it's a hard problem. So, First, we've had an excellent 40 years in people who care about fairness and equality focused on issues of misrecognition of identity of uh, excluded groups 
of historically dominated groups, while at the same time a relative um, 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 loss of capacity to understand class and economic inequality. And I think a lot of the work that I'm uh, talking about these networks is about trying to revive that. Here, let me just uh, uh, build a little bit on what Nancy Fraser tried to do in her work to understand the relative role of socialist feminism within other forms of, me of, of, of um, um, uh, feminism uh, to leverage Max Weber's uh, uh, class status party description. And think of it this way. If we think of what she calls maldistribution, its original location is the economy. It's a relationship of power based on economic resources with economic outcomes as its original location. And I say original location because as you've already heard from everything I've said up till now, power in each of these dimensions gets leveraged into the others as well. The point again is not to say only this matters or this matters more than the other. They all interconnect. The point is to put them apart so that you can pick up and examine each one and try to solve each one independently after, before you put them again together. And think of the form of wrong as exploitation. And I'll come back to why that matters in terms of the difficulties of working on, on algorithms. She distinguishes this from something that is uh, misrecognition. Uh, whose origin is in kinship and culture and is about status that is not based just on economic power, where the form of wrong is discrimination and inappropriate distinction between, based on status and recognition of identity and worth rather than specifically on economic exploitation. And I'll leave for now the question of party and, and political oppression because I'm really focused here. The parallel analysis is to understand that actors have different power over resources because of past struggles over institutional technology and ideology of the kind that I described to you. They exercise it in social relations of production on who gets what and who does what that reflect themselves reflect power over resources and production. Power is the normal case in market and distributive inequality reflects that unequal power. Interestingly, from our perspective, misrecognition is a problem for firms on the productivity line of issues as well. And this is where you see the congruence between firms interested in preventing discrimination and people working out of their own ethics to achieve discrimination. Because hiring the wrong person because you've misrecognized their worth because of a status position is bad along the productivity seeking line of strategic action. On the other hand, it's perfectly lovely as another dimension through which you can extract value and rents, which is where you get on one hand you want all the talented women, on the other hand you want to exploit and give lower uh, relative uh, prices. So there are, there are inten internal tensions within the strategy of firms and that means there's some alignment between people who are interested in fairness in algorithms and firms when we're talking about productivity improvements in those dimensions, and real tension when we're talking about uh, exploitation, and particularly when we're talking about advantage through exploitation uh, that is always, um, uh, uh, in some sense, a mode of firms uh, uh, extracting value. If we zoom in specifically on technology, we see a lot of conversations now about commodity or product controlling uh, uh, technologies like DRM, like the Terminator gene, et cetera, but most importantly on demand shaping technologies. Again, remember, if you can apply a nudge, human biases, experimentally validated technique to get people to want X over Y and to really want it, you can extract rents from them in the direct transaction, but you can also make it harder for competitors to enter by artificially inflating the difference between the products. So that's an incredibly powerful model. And if people want to talk about propaganda, I've spent too much of the last three weeks on it. It also operates in propaganda. Um, the same with regard to competitors we've already talked, but specifically let me now focus on workers. And there's relatively older work on the way in which technology has been used to exercise power over workers, whether it was studies of, of, of how canners uh, 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 were how, how, how uh, tin makers, tin smiths were replaced in canneries in the 19th century, how iron molders were replaced um, uh, in the McCormick Reaper plant, all with machines that were less productive 
than the artisanal craft producers, but broke the unions. Through David Noble's work on, on, on automated, on, on uh, um, um, uh, numerical control machine tools, um, uh, there's been a lot of work on that. Specifically here, um, uh, if you look at uh, uh, Karen Levy and Solon Barocas's refractive surveillance, you see specifically how in the context of uh, uh, customer relations, being able to extract some of the knowledge of experienced salespeople in order to homogenize their skills and make it harder for them to bargain over wages and easier to replace them. Similarly, in the context of Karen's work on, on truck drivers, you see the same thing of internal um, um, uh, control. Um, you see a lot of work on labor monitoring, and labor monitoring sure makes life miserable, but just in terms of the standard economic model of efficiency wages has a very simple trade-off. If you have perfect sticks, you don't need to give carrots. If you don't have perfect sticks, you need to give more carrots. Labor monitoring is a way of making your, your sticks very large and very precise, which means you can keep more of the carrots in your pocket. It's a rent extraction uh, techniques, and you see that work um, uh, uh, in Fomir Juna's work, in, in Vina Dubal's work, and labor organizing disrupting technologies. This was very clear in Mary Gray and, uh, and, and Sidra Sturi's ghost work. It makes no sense for people not to be able to collaborate on these platforms, and yet they don't because you don't want them uh, to organize against them. Critically, the technologies here are employed strategically in ways that shift power from employees to employers and are consistent with the distributive outcome we've seen in the last 40 years. So why is this hard from my minimal understanding of what you do? Admittedly minimal. Discrimination imagines that it's focused on discrete individual attributes. These are immutable, and it was really interesting. One of the presentations, I can't remember which one, I'm sorry. Um, someone stood up here this morning and said, we know that gender is fluid, but we used male and female and black and white, because it's doable, whereas fluidity is much harder. It's much e more easy to formalize categorical classification for purposes of classification tasks and building classification tasks. Um, by contrast, exploitation is relational and situational. That is to say, what is the right distribution between us? I don't know. Tell me what you are. Tell me what I am. Tell me what we're producing together. How did it play out? What are your other alternatives? It's always in the situation and in the relation. It's very hard to identify a discrete single attribute or three attributes that you can compose in order to create, as opposed to something that is continuously contextually updated. Um, therefore, race and gender are the classic examples that I've seen here used all uh, uh, the last day and a half, whereas class is much more resistant to formalization. Um, uh, and finally, in terms of the institutional context in which the research is done, Anti-discrimination has reached a point of being value neutral in contemporary democratic societies. I won't say no one is for discrimination because there are plenty of people who are, but within these professional elites, it's value neutral. It's also, and this came up in the last panel, arguably illegal and certainly illegal in many cases. By comparison, class and exploitation is highly contested and either legal or, or contested. Similarly, as I already mentioned, anti-discrimination is very often aligned with corporate goals, whereas anti-exploitation rarely is, except in those companies that follow high road, good job strategies that exist, but are not uh, uh, the norm. So what that means for me, in addition to this paper from last year that was here by, by Selfs Boyd and others, um, uh, Ben Green and Salome Villarreal's paper from early uh, yesterday morning, uh, that you need to expand, uh, you need integrated systems, you can't fully focus just on, on the algorithm and the, and, and the um, uh, technical uh, answer. Um, I do want to emphasize things that are discrete let me put it differently. 
I'll put it on the table for you whether these are really there. And I got a little bit of, of, of support yesterday from Karen's focus on, on diagnosis uh, as, as something that, that computer scientists can do. And let me just talk about this. Anything that can be measured enough to build an algorithm in principle should be made susceptible to monitoring and copying and putting somewhere. What one important thing that auditing should mean would be to export the data to some other place where power is elsewhere. And critically, I'd say benchmarking as a way of trying to identify relational and situational um, um, uh, exploitation. And this is where, to the half of you who raised your hand and said you're computer scientists, this is my invitation um, uh, for where I, I'd say for diagnosis. Uh, 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 you, you, uh, I'd be interested in seeing. How do we define the relationship dynamically and the situation? What are like situations and not like situations? There are simple things, right? Looking at outcomes like um, um, income or hours relative to some normative baseline, uh, minimum wage, fair work week regulations. More interesting would be being able to collect data from high road organizations that are able to play in the same industry in the same sector, but with higher uh, uh, returns or with more um, uh, worker-friendly schedules rather than more exploitative schedules, and use those as benchmarks so that the purpose is, and obviously I haven't done the work, um, but the purpose here is to do uh, the formalization work. Again, I come back to Karen's point yesterday about diagnosis and formalization. Taking exploitation and moving it from being a hand-waving exercise like mine into a discrete, what do I mean? I mean that somebody in the same job having the same characteristics, makes less money or has less security in their, uh, in their workflow time, and here's how I'm going to measure it, and here's how I'm going to operationalize it, and here's how I'm going to identify the confounders. Getting that to a point where it's susceptible to implementation in an instantiated system strikes me as something that could fundamentally change the political debate about this and something that you are uniquely positioned to do uh, in a way that the rest of us are not. The second thing is you really have to think in terms of data flows on where countervailing power is and there's no single place. There are places where there's a genuine government authority that functions reasonably well and that becomes the right place to try to locate the, the auditing and control. There are many places where that's not true, but there are real collective action bases, whether they're unions, whether they're civil society organizations, whether they're networks that are informal, that's where the data needs to go. And sometimes there isn't. Sometimes what there is is protest. And that's what it requires. But, but expanding the view into integrated systems doesn't mean the state necessarily or civil society necessarily. It means in the historical, political, cultural moment of the country or, or area in the world that you're focused on, who is the appropriate custodian of the data? And one way to think about it is, and with this I'll finish, is the origin and debates around the movement for black lives that start with a simple fact of sensors, mobile phones, capturing video of police shooting of unarmed black men and changing the public discourse through look at it, capture the information, export it to something that the police doesn't control, and then make a political movement out of it. This then led to a major movement towards body cameras that were intended to do the same thing but bureaucratize and regularize it. What happened in many departments because of the strength of the police is that the on and off say, uh, uh, say, uh, 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 button came in the hands of the police and the initial video came to the hands of the police department. And the system got flipped into surveillance of the community and exculpation instead of an auditing system. Not because of anything that happened with the technology as technology, but because of the way in which data flowed and was managed when it was on, when it was off, critical to do, but also an example of how technology can shift the balance of power one way, but then power can reshift the technology in the other in ways that are uh, central. So that's my invitation to you. Participate in this particular uh, framework. Uh, and it will be across not only 
for fairness in algorithms, but essentially across all of the major uh, transformations and in all of the spheres of life, not only in the economy, but in polity, in kinship, and in culture. Thank you. So I will just basically kick off uh, the discussion, but I very much hope that you will um, line up for questions and also you can ask questions on the pad, so please um, do so. Um, I guess... This was, this was a very uh, large and uh, big discussion around situating technology more in political economy, getting us to shift our frame and perhaps our entry point into some of these um, discussions. But I think just to kick us off, I wanted to ground it just a little bit also in terms of the community here and perhaps um, people who go and work or engage with uh, the technology sector. And that is, going back to the earlier parts of your talk, these struggles over power, how do you position technology workers and particularly technology workers who work in firms but might be engaging with this community in terms of their power? Where are they situated? Uh, so, obviously, one of the things we're seeing now is the beginning of uh, technology workers actually organizing and speaking out and firms cracking down, and that's going to be a major uh, uh, dimension of, of, of battle. Um, I think in this regard, we've seen it already in the, um, in the first round, essentially, of internet politics, where similarly you had workers inside technology firms, doing things on the side as part of free software projects, occasionally coming out with their own assertion of authority, but large differences between different firms in terms of the, the extent to which they control and were open uh, to people doing this. So, to me, um, there are at least, first of all, I actually, the real answer is, what do you think? Uh, uh, that's the real answer, because it's a, it, 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 um, um, I'm at three steps removed from trying to answer this question. Uh, but again, looking back, some organizations are not perfectly efficient, control is far from complete, and people can nudge and shove and do all sorts of things on the project they're working on if they think something matters. Second, there's the more formal collective action that we've seen. Uh, and third, there's what people do outside, both uh, in terms of politics, but also in terms of technology development. But I'd be, in some sense, more curious to hear what people see as their own, is this something you want to work on? To me, even thinking about this, about... For me, what's important about this, for people in this room, is to recognize that exploitation is distinct and presents a distinct problem from discrimination, but that it is also central to fairness. And that when you think of fairness, and all you're thinking about is discrimination, it's not that you're thinking wrong. Right? Discrimination is critically important. It's that it's incomplete, and that there's a distinct concern to work on. And then bringing that into your work, I think, is valuable. Okay. Um, I have one of further questions, but maybe we'll take uh, one from the floor. Hi, uh, great talk. Uh, I have a question regarding like the, how is uh, exploitation related to the idea of information asymmetry? And uh, uh, especially now that we are trying to formalize things and maybe make like central technology, does the necessary, I mean, you also covered it in the talk, but uh, when you make like uh, centralized and global technology, then uh, the actors in uh, different countries uh, the top actors, they have more likelihood of controlling their technology, uh, as you showed in the last example also, like uh, in the body cameras. So uh, how, how should people move back to the more like localized technology, which I think like earlier people used to have like just local technology, which is higher, higher cost, but known to everyone, uh, rather than like uh, globalized technology, which is known to only a few people, and that's why like this information asymmetry exists. Can we take two questions at the same time? Just because there's so many people. Sure, sure. 
that time. Sure. Is that okay? Yeah. Actually, my, mine was very similar, just thinking of many countries in the world when large platforms call, they, the platforms don't pick up the phones, particularly small island states and so on, and how that fits into your framework. So it's very parallel to that question. Okay, so let me take both. First, information asymmetry and then uh, uh, global uh, providers, uh, which, which I can't forget Lillian's uh, chlorinated chicken uh, example, which I think is sort of a high point. Um, um, think of design elements in a system. So Uber, does the driver see where the destination is or isn't? and how that affects their ability to negotiate over whether they will or won't. That's a design feature in information asymmetry that's intended essentially to lower the reservation price of the worker because of the probability of a better uh, 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 service, and in exchange allow the firm to extract more. That's what I mean by information asymmetry playing into uh, bargaining power, and it can happen on this very micro dimension. It can happen on the entire Framework. I think again, uh, 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 Mary Gray and, uh, and Senator Thury's book on, on, on ghost work has a lot on how the structure of the platform disables employees from getting together, figuring out what's good and what's not good. So that's a classic instance, and the same is true with regard to uh, market power and ability. So, so, so I think information asymmetry is absolutely central. I'll rephrase that. Perfect information is central for the even possibility of perfect markets. Information asymmetry means perfect markets are impossible and power is asymmetrically distributed based on who has information. Um, on this global question, um, <clears throat> first of all, realistically, I think the politics side has to happen at the level of very large and economically meaningful state levels which for all practical purposes uh, means the US, the EU, and China. Uh, that's where there's forcing power. And if you're talking about democratic values, then we're really talking about, at best, the US on every four to eight, 12 years, and, and Europe sometimes in some contexts. Um, uh, it's very hard, I think, for uh, countries that don't have the ability to resist to actually make um, um, uh, meaningful changes to the technology. That said, uh, you know, look at, a, uh, look at a time scheduling platform. In principle, you should be able to adapt it to your own organization so that the inputs are not how you minimize worker compensation, but how you, maxim uh, how you optimize worker choice and preference. That's not something that the, the technology in some sense is agnostic and it's just a question of how you optimize it. Uh, and that's the sort of thing where if you have power over the organizations in your country and how they integrate the technology, and this is, I think, in this regard, something that STS is very powerful on, then that's the relevant power. If you can, if you can, if you can meaningfully shape adoption of those aspects of the technology that are... Um, um, that are relatively tweakable, that makes a big difference. But again, the, the, this is why it's so important for people who are working inside the industry and are setting the terms for the vast majority of people in the world to be conscious and to be active about it because you are setting, you are setting the, the terms of, of, of engagement throughout the world. Okay, let's take two more questions from the floor. So one there. Hi, uh, thank you very much for your talk. I had a question or, or wanted to know your thoughts on kind of what are the implications for this community, particularly talking in domains like housing and criminal justice on the silence of racism. Um, and so thinking about uh, even the points you made about the implications of using discrimination as opposed to as opposed to exploitation. How do we understand that in terms of our language around anti-racism and calling out racism? Um, and then the second question was about thinking about the beginning of your talk that talked about the history of labor movements and kind of tying that into how we understand racism and free labor, whether that be slavery, whether that be prison labor. How do we understand that in the context of productivity um, and that impact on technology? Thanks. Hi, I Han Nguyen with Data and Society. I just want to say thank you very much for this talk as someone who works on uh, labor issues. I've attended this conference feeling like the conversation has 
sort of not been able to name the harms created to workers, particularly low-wage workers through technology. My question is, I understand we're talking to a data science audience, but there is a role for policy and politics, and how can uh, computer scientists be engaged in that conversation so it doesn't seem like we are recreating the conversations and the categorizations and the legal frameworks that currently already exist? And related, is there a space there then to strengthen what has essentially become weakened labor laws through this process? Can you just repeat the last sentence? Uh, is there a space then through this, through technical tools, to essentially strengthen labor laws and worker protections that have kind of been eroded in the country, or this country? So thank you for these two hard questions. Uh, I'm sorry, where? where, where? Um, uh, part of what I'm trying, first of all, you, the, the question you've raised of how we integrate what we know to be the wrong of racism with what we are developing to understand as the, as the uh, uh, norm of, of, of as, as the uh, harm of exploitation, to me is one of the central challenges of contemporary debates over justice. And when I say that the work that I'm doing is part of a network of networks or, 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 or overlapping networks of people in social and behavioral sciences and philosophy is precisely to try to understand that answer. And I don't think we have a grasp over it that's complete. And I don't want to pretend that we do. That said, one of the things, for example, that I see people doing effectively in the US is reviving the extent to which the civil rights movement in the 60s saw labor and race as tightly integrated um, um, uh, struggles that understood that at any given moment it wasn't that race was just a reflection of class or that class was beside the point but that the two were tightly integrated. Certainly um, uh, racial, racism and racial resentment was consistently used to break up the working class in the US and create a relative weakness and an opportunity for exploitation uh, this was my reference to dog whistle politics and, and the roles of race in American uh, politics. And, and uh, it's not the only thing, but it's part of the story. And I think that's what we're trying to do. Part of what I'm trying to do here is recover from existing efforts a sense of how one emphasizes one, how, how one is able to recover a sense of the wrong of exploitation that's economic without somehow prioritizing it relative to race as either subordinate or as superior, but as complementary and additive. Uh, and that's the task, and, that's, and, and I think there are many people trying to do that now. This is my effort, again, based on uh, transposing Nancy Fraser's efforts within feminism to actually try to hold both of those, the truth of both of those wrongs together and then try to define the relationship between them. Um, policy. I'm sort of a law school professor. I should be able to do that. Um, so, uh, but, you, but, but the critical question I wanted to focus on is what, the, what people here are able to do. And I'd say part of it, and again, I'm, I'm in this regard stuck in the past. I'm looking at the first set of, of technology policy wars. Um, and what, ha what did computer scientists do? Part of it was just build technology. If you know this matters, and you're at one of the firms uh, that, that it matters. And you can actually make, for example, a fair work week scheduling program that surfaces exploitation when it happens and makes it easy and default to actually have uh, something that allows people to balance their family and work. Do that, develop the technology, make it clear that firms are choosing one thing as opposed to the other with your hat as um, uh, doing something outside of the firms, develop technology that then emphasizes the ways in which technology is being used to cover up exploitative uh, uh, um, practices, so then it, makes it clear for, for, then it makes it clear what it is for a policy intervention. So those are, those are the, the directions that I mostly see. I just wanted to bring in, because it relates to this, a question from uh, online that I guess uh, asks about in shifting our focus to exploitation, is it appropriate to think of platforms using the market metaphor as a question here? And then also, can 
we make uh, exploitation computable. Does that make sense? Uh, so, um, can we, th it, 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 are platforms, markets, or distinct? For this particular purpose, platforms are an even clearer case of what I'm talking about because both the institutions, the contractual terms, and the technology are all centralized in a firm that has its own uh, uh, agenda of extracting as much of the value as possible while maintaining the ecosystem. So everything we talked about a single firm then becomes the relevant framework. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, the second part of the question was? It's, it's about your diagnosis emphasis oh. on exploitation. So, 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 this is, so this is the question I, can, I, I tried to think, because this was something you wanted us when we had email about what we should talk, I, I sort of preempted it by trying to add it, because you had raised the question of what can you do, and, and as I was thinking of that, I really do think that that's the, that's the critical intervention. Is exploitation computable? I don't know, you do. Right? I'm asking you that question because I think it's a major contribution you can make. If you can move exploitation from arm waving by people like me to a computable, operationalizable, instantiated uh, assertion about a set of social relations of production, you will have done something huge. Okay, let's have two more questions. Um, hi, I'm... I'm, I'm Mari, I'm an engineer at Google and aspiring philosopher. Um, so I have a like, slightly broad question slash clarification. You use the concept of institutions um, in your like, ideology, knowledge, individual, firms, everything, sort of a power context. And so what I, so I, I on one hand, I, I think I don't necessarily understand what the role of institution in this is. And then I want to suggest that I think um, there are several levels of institutions. And on one sense, the political institutions, maybe they do something where they try to like slow down the shifts and changes in, in power motions and, and things like that. And then we can also say that, let's say 10, 20, 30 years ago, we start seeing the rise of institutions of science where we ask this different questions, we have different goals, we are in the quest for truth and now you, you know, like everything changes. And so the point of this question is, do you think there's a need and do you think we are starting to form our own institutions? Because, you know, I mean, all, all of this and, and our questions. Thank you. This will be the final questions I'm, I'm afraid that we'll have. Thanks. People have touched on this, but I wanted to ask whether you saw a deep difference between race and class or discrimination and exploitation. So you had the one slide where uh, there's kind of discrimination, formalizable, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, exploitation, not yet done or not so. And it struck me at least that everything in the exploitation category should also be under the discrimination category. And indeed that many of the explanations you gave for exploitation also applied to discrimination. So just ask you to say more about that. Okay. Um, I owed you definitions. I had them in the backup slides and then I just dropped them. <laughs> um, um, institutions I'm using in the way in which um, I'd say it was used in the old institutional economics, the way it's used in some aspects of new institutionalism in political science and in sociology. What I mean in a very uh, abstract sense is instructions for what to do and how to behave in certain social situations that have affordances and constraints that form the situation. I don't know where you are, so I'm sort of looking in the general, oh, there you are, uh, right behind the, the line. Um, now, instructions is a bit too formal because I'm definitely talking about things that are both implicit and explicit, that are tacitly known, but also susceptible to instructions. So I'm not talking about the ministry of so-and-so. That's an organization that functions according to a set of institutions. Uh, when you're talking about the emergence of professional norms, you're talking about a set of institutions that govern people only where they're in the social relation that constitutes the profession, and when they're acting in that role, the same person can be under a different set of institutions and need can be layered over each other. 
So what I'm using, the, now in principle you could describe institutions and ideology as the same thing, because this is just a set of rules for how we recognize things and make meaning. And either it's useful to distinguish between knowledge and meaning and how we understand what we value or not, versus how we understand what sort of behavior will cause legal sanctions, uh, shaming and gossip, a sense of guilt that's internalized, and try to treat those as institutions and what do I know and not know, believe or not believe, prefer or not believe, prefer as ideology. But I make no claim of, of, of ontological truth to any of these, only of utility, if they help me analyze systems that cause one or the other to change in ways that have meaningful impact on behavior. Um, yeah, sure. <laughs> like, the answer is, um, uh, of course you can uh, um, uh, ascribe, you can, is race a thing? No, right, in terms of in any kind of scientifically useful sense, we have a century of research denying the category. Is gender a thing? Well, it's not a century, but we know it's fluid, we have massive uh, challenges, which is why I had immutable in these quotation marks, because they're particularly socially constructed. However, we do use them in normal practice, in ways that we sometimes uh, treat as though, not sometimes, we usually treat as though they're clear yes or no, they're susceptible to formalizable uh, classification, um, and so my effort here, and this was an effort, again, to translate and begin to understand what it is that's going on in this community, and I'd love to continue this conversation. My effort was to try to sharpen the differences, um, and certainly I'd say in political usage, in American political usage for sure, they've been used differently. They've been used as much more sharp categories, as much more related to status that's translated into economic advantage rather than specifically to discreetly economic uh, relations um, and therefore susceptible to being treated as this sort of categorical difference as opposed to always and necessarily relational and situational. I'm, 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 um, this, is, this is something that I'm happy to continue to have the conversation on uh, because clear, uh, I, I agree with you. It's, it's contested and in some sense artificial precisely in order to try to understand why it is that this community seems to spend its time so heavily on discrimination uh, while talking in principle about exploitation in these broader books but, but less work that's been operationalizing it and why it might be hard. Great. Well, we have to finish there uh, for lunch. So thank you very much uh, to your identity.